Reading from Amos today, my mind turns to thoughts of darkness. I wonder, have you ever experienced darkness so utter that it becomes almost tangible? I have. One summer when I was home from college, I went spelunking with my sister Cassie and my friends Matt and Charles. There's this cave in the Little Belt Mountains south of Great Falls. It's not marked on any map. There's no signs or directions to get you there. If you want to go there, you have to know where you're going. I'd been there once as a kid, but that was a long time ago, and I was the only one of the four of us who'd ever been. So even after getting directions from my dad on how to get there, we still had to stop and ask a local rancher once we got close. Once you get to this cave, there really isn't much to see. Just a hole in the ground with some rope. You climb about 30 feet down this narrow hole, mostly on a ladder with slippery uh, and missing rungs. In the last eight feet or so, you have to climb down hand over hand by rope. Once you're on the floor of that first room, you immediately have to get on your belly and slide through the mud under this little crevice that's only about 18 inches tall. From there, the cave goes back what seems like forever. It's probably only really only about a quarter of a mile or so. Um, but most of it is spent on your hands and your knees. One of the main features of this cave is the bottomless pit. Of course, it's not really bottomless, but when you're uh, on your hands and knees up against the side of the wall looking over into this pit, it sure looks bottomless. Um, people throw rocks down there and you can't ever hear them hit the bottom. Once you crawl around this bottomless pit, you're most of the way to the end of the cave, to the big room. Now the big room is exactly what it sounds like. It's this cavern uh, 500 feet across. This enormous open space that suddenly appears at the end of this tight, short scramble under the earth. And the ceiling of this cavern is maybe, I don't know, 100 feet up or something like that. And under that ceiling, the room is dominated by uh, this pile of fallen rock. There's a pile of boulders, really. So when we came to this big room, my sister and my friends and I decided for some reason that we should climb up to the top of this pile and sit there and eat our lunch. I don't remember exactly why we decided we wanted to climb to the top. Maybe it was for the view. Inside this cave, if you turn off your flashlight, the dark isn't just black. It's solid. It becomes a thing. You're as completely blind as if your head were in a sack. No light seeps in from the surface, and you can't see your own hand inches in front of your nose. Because this room is so large, most flashlights aren't powerful enough to see the opposite wall. So even with all of our lamps on, we were sitting here in an island of light amidst a sea of solid and impenetrable blackness. Now we made it to the top of the pile just fine, because all we had to do was keep going up. But because the darkness was so thick, and because the path through the boulders was so winding, getting back down was a different story. Because you see, there's 360 degrees of down, but only one heading will get us back to where we came in. We started picking our way down the boulders, but we got turned around. Soon before we knew it, we weren't going down anymore, we were going up. We figured we must have found another pile, and so we thought, well, let's get to the top and see if we can see the summit we just came from. Well, so we kept going up, we got to the top, and what did we find? But our picnic area. The very same rock where we'd sat down to eat. We just made one giant circle. So, we started down again. This time, we were determined. We were just going to go in a straight line, as straight as we could. But once again, the uneven ground and the misleading dark brought us back again to our picnic area. Now, by this time, we were getting pretty frightened. We're here alone in this cave. We have no way of knowing for sure how to get out other than our memories and those that already failed us twice. We sat down and we collected ourselves and began to consider how we're going to find the bottom of this rock pile 
and how, once we did that, we were going to find the exit to this room. Most of us have never encountered dark like this. It's darn near impossible to find a place so dark and so silent as the, inside the belly of the earth. Our world is filled with street lamps and light bulbs and LEDs uh, and computer screens. And even when it isn't, the moon and the stars provide even the faintest light and keep us from being completely enveloped in darkness. Even the deceptive shadows of the dark forest at night uh, give some point of reference. In that cave, there was nothing. We're so used to being able to see with even some clarity that those moments and those ways in which we can't see are completely disorienting and disturbing and even panic-inducing. Beloveds, we are living in times which are, please forgive the cliché, unprecedented. Never before has our generation been in this particular situation, this confluence of pandemic and contentious uh, election and climate change and public protest against injustice. Any one of these things by themselves would be enough to confound this, confound us. But all of them together? In a way, we are collectively sitting in that cave in Montana, huddled around our picnic spot for the third time or the 30th time or the 300th time, trying to figure out what to do next. In that moment, I had to fight down panic. Each of us wished dearly for some answer, some sign which way to go. If only, we said, if only we had thought to bring some candles or glow sticks and to leave one burning by the entrance to the room so that we could uh, pick out that, that tiny pinprick of light against the darkness. If only we had brought some string or twine so that we could uh, mark our way up and find our way back. If only we had been prepared for this. But how could we have been prepared? How could we have known that this is what we were going to face, that that was where we were going to end up? How could we have known, beloveds? How could we have known that in November of 2020, we'd be worshiping from our homes and avoiding our friends and afraid to go outside? How could we have known that days after the presidential election we'd still be waiting to find out who'd won? How could we have known that it would become imperative for us to state the obvious, that black lives do in fact matter? Is it any wonder that we're starting to panic now, children of God? Is it that it's that panic that's creeping into our lives, in our, into our relationships, into our civic engagements, and it's starting to turn us against one another. Just like Matt and Cassie and I bickered about who was right and which way we had to go down. Is it any wonder that lost in such a present and threatening darkness, we begin to fight among ourselves just like that? But the hard truth, my beloveds, is that fighting amongst ourselves is not going to get us out of here. It's tempting to point out the faults and the failures of others, but Amos reminds us today that we all share some responsibility for ending up where we are. Whether it's fair or not, whether we deserve it or not, we're stuck here, in the dark, and nothing's going to change that. The darkness of that cave was a judgment on Matt and Charles and Cassie and me. Not a punishment, not a condemnation, but a judgment, a moment which revealed a certain truth, that we had not been prepared. We had successfully fumbled our way into the cave, but blind groping wasn't going to get us back out of it. What Amos and Jesus both want us to hear, I think, is that the day of the Lord is coming. That whether we are ready for it or not, there will come a moment when we are faced 
with that uh, same sort of clarity that the four of us had in that cave. Justice is coming. Healing is coming. That moment of clarity, it is coming. And that's good news. But it's also a wake-up call. We need to be ready because like exploring that cave, we want to see those things, but we may not fully realize what they mean. With all that is uncertain, there is one thing that we do know. We know that God is God and that we are God's people, God's children. We know that God's love will not leave us stranded in this big room, huddled atop this pile of boulders. We know that God has a vision for the wholeness and the creation, the whole, excuse me, the wholeness of creation and the healing of humanity. That although that vision might be delayed, it cannot be held back. The bridegroom is coming, even if we don't know when. This thick darkness is no obstacle to God, for in the beginning, Everything was darkness, and the Spirit of God moved over the darkness, and God spoke light into being. That's what I mean when I say that we know that God is God. We know that God is going to keep doing what God has always done, bringing life, creating light, doing justice, loving creation into being. Now the four of us made it out of that room, and we made it out by working together, by trusting one another, by coming up with a plan and sticking to it. We hadn't prepared coming in, but now sitting atop that mound, we had to prepare how we were gonna get out. We decided that if our problem was not being able to go in a straight line, we'd leapfrog down the pile. So we, uh, we still remembered which direction we'd come in from, so we sat facing that, and we started down. We left one person at the top, and we went down in a straight line, and they guided us. And once we got to another point, we left another person, and the other two kept going. So that we and we kept doing that, so that we could make a point, a line in between each of us to make sure we were still headed in the right direction. And lo and behold, when we finally reached the bottom, there was the tunnel entrance waiting for us. We made it out that day, children of God, but you can bet that next time I go down in that cave, and I do intend to go back, you can be darn sure that I am bringing some glow sticks with me. Now that I know what I need to be prepared, I'm going to be ready next time. I'm not going to count on chance. As we wait with hopeful expectation for the day of the Lord, I wonder what we will need to be ready. I wonder what this moment is teaching us about what we wish we had, about what we feel we need more of, and how that is gonna help us prepare. I wonder what kind of oil we are being called to put in our flasks. I may not have solid answers for you, but I know one who does. One who's been to this cave before and who knows what we need when we get there. What was the oil that sustained Jesus through his life, through his trials? What was it that allowed him to stand up and shake off the crucifixion? What was it that guided him in his every moment of time among us? I suspect that's the oil we're looking for. As we plan ahead for that great and terrible day of the Lord, it's good to know that we're not planning alone. 